Well, a warm welcome to today's talk. It's Sunday evening, the 11th of July. Now, it's a bit of an unusual update today. I want to focus primarily on Africa, looking at some of the issues there. And um, basically, I'm looking at it because it's a concern at the moment. But I want to start with a bit of orientation first. So let's just look at a few graphics for that. Uh, here we have Europe the daily cases in Europe. Now, France and the United States, coincidentally, are fairly similar. Um, I've left the United States on for comparison. Obviously, it's not in Europe. Um, Malta increasing. Europe in general, that's the average for Europe increasing. Greece, Portugal, well, that's the Portugal... No, sorry, that's the Netherlands line there. So that's in, no, that Netherlands is increasing dramatically at the moment really exponential increase in Netherlands. And Portugal's got to about the same level as well. Spain and the United Kingdom. So unfortunately, what we're seeing is what we've anticipated for some time, is as the Delta variant is becoming more established in Europe, the cases are going up as they have done in the United Kingdom. Vaccinations in Europe still aren't where they are in the UK. They're not yet up to that level, but they are accelerating really quite well. So again, it's going to be a delicate balance in Europe, as in the UK, between the Delta variant and vaccination. That race really is still on. Cases increasing dramatically. Hopefully this is not transposing through into as great an increase in hospitalizations and deaths. The link between cases and uh, hospitalizations and deaths is not fully broken. It's massively weakened, but we're still concerned about the likely incidence of long COVID because that's not necessarily related to the severity of the condition. So quite a few unknowns there, really. So that's the Europe situation. Now, new data confirmed cases per million people in Asia. Now, Pakistan is way down the bottom here. So I haven't put that on because I don't believe the figures from Pakistan. But these figures we have got Vietnam, Cambodia, again, the United States for comparison, Bangladesh, Myanmar, that used to be Burma, Thailand and Malaysia. Malaysia, though, the testing is quite a lot better and Thailand, the testing is fairly reasonable than in some of these other countries. So the gaps are probably not as pronounced as they actually appear on this graphic. Now, this is the South America situation and basically we are seeing downward trends throughout South America, which, of course, is massively encouraging. A lot of South America, of course, still in its winter time. So Venezuela, Mexico, slight increase, Peru fairly level, but Bolivia, Chile, Paraguay, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia. Um, we are seeing encouraging downward trends there. So let's just hope those downward trends continue. Now, I want to focus on Africa largely today. So let's just look at this graphic here. So the United Kingdom cases, United States and Africa. So we can see that the United Kingdom's got massively more cases. But of course, this depends on the testing. So this is our world in data testing figures for the United States and the United Kingdom. And actually, um, before I put this graphic on, it might surprise you a bit if you're in the United, United States. The, the testing in the UK is way higher now than in the United States. So let's look at that. But bearing in mind the cases in Africa are progressively rising here. And here we have the testing in the UK, which is relatively high. The testing in the United States, which has gone down a bit. And I haven't left off the tests for the Africa uh, situation. They're simply too low to be recorded on our world in, in data. So basically what's happening, we don't really know for sure because of the very, very, very limited testing. So let's move on to Africa now. No, let's move on to the rest of the world next. So uh, global cases, this is, this is from World Meter. 187 million, deaths over 4 million, recovered 171 million. So deaths we see now over 4 million, officially uh, global deaths from the pandemic. The real number will be higher. Now moving on to the Africa situation, which we wanted to look at. Now, this is from um, World Health Organization Africa report last Thursday. So it's about three days, four days out of date, but still still reasonably. It's the best we've got at the moment. Cases have risen consecutively for seven weeks in Africa now. The onset of the third wave, the World Health Organization said, was the third of um, the third of May, they said, was the onset of the third wave. So obviously the data is limited, but this is, this is what we've got. Week ending the 4th of July, 
uh, where there's fairly full data for what we've got. Cases are up a quarter of a million in Africa, 251,000 in the seven days. Now, we know this is grossly inaccurate, but it's interesting for comparison because even though the testing was adequate, it, inadequate, it still is inadequate, but it's still gone up. And and from the accounts we're hearing on the ground of people getting sick and the number of cases, this is it is it is true that the cases have gone up consistently for the past seven weeks in Africa. Again, so sad because the Delta variant's now sweeping through Africa because it had done so well for the first part of the pandemic and we dared to be optimistic for over a year about Africa. But unfortunately, uh, we have to uh, retract that optimism. 20% increase on the week. So again, you know, it's probably roughly where we are at. Cases are now reported as 276,884 in the past seven days. Again, this is officially diagnosed cases. The real numbers are massively high because we don't even know the extent of the testing in Africa. 16 countries in Africa in resurgence. Delta variant in 10 of these, and I suspect in the other six as well, because we simply have such limited genomic testing. So not only have we got very limited antigen testing, lateral flow and PCR testing, when PCR diagnoses are made, the proportion of those that get genomically sequenced are remarkably low. But we do know the Delta variant is in 10 countries. And the Delta variant has now also definitely been uh, genomically diagnosed in Nigeria, a very populated country, of course. So we are expecting a lot more cases of the Delta variant in Nigeria. And it could be a really severe issue there, actually. Um, that, is, that is currently one of the one of my main concerns in terms of the population that could be affected. A doctor from the World Health Organization, regional director of Africa, direct quotes. Africa just marked the uh, continent's most dire pandemic week ever. It's the worst it's been, uh, but the worst is yet to come as the fast moving third wave continues to gain speed and new ground. So quite clearly, the worst is yet to come for Africa, which is bad. Uh, the end to this precipitous rise is still weeks away. So we can anticipate, if not look forward to, um, a great increase in cases in Africa over the coming weeks. Cases are doubling now every 18 days compared with every 21 days a week ago. Um, we can still break the chain of transmission by testing, isolating contacts and cases following key public health measures. In theory, that is possible. Now, the vaccination situation in Africa, let's just look at it briefly here. Now, this is from uh, Deutsche Welle News, actually. So we see these countries, Africa, 1.1% vaccinated. So basically, we see countries in Africa that have some vaccine uptake. And all the countries um, in uh, light grey have no vaccines being delivered and the grey ones uh, very uh, below 1%. So pretty low vaccine uptake, not uptake, just a supply issues. The, the vaccines simply aren't available in, uh, in those parts of Africa. COVAX, May and June were very poor. Now, a lot of the COVAX international um, UNWHO distribution, of course, was from India. And obviously, we know the story of India. They needed all they can get for themselves. India is still massively under vaccinated. They're still at risk from a third wave and um, can't really afford to export many vaccines. So that was a big dent in the COVAX program. Past two weeks, 1.6 million doses through COVAX to Africa. Now, the um, WHO were kind of mouthing off about this, but 1.6 million, of course, is not much at all for Africa. Uh, 20 million Johnson & Johnson are being released by the United States. That's good news. And of course, this is uh, Johnson Johnson Janssen. Uh, one dose, and but they're getting Pfizer as well. In coordination with the African Union to 49 countries in Africa. Norway and Sweden are also sending some soon. And these are good, of course. These are good. 20 million from the States is good. It's not enough, but it's good. Um, but UNICEF seems to be doing much better than the United Nations Children Fund, of course. Agreement to supply African Union with 220 million doses of single-dose Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine by the end of 2022. So it's a long way off, but it's 220 million doses. So that's starting to make an, an indentation. Well over a billion people in Africa, of course.
2021, 35 million doses will be arriving from UNICEF. So UNICEF uh, doing better than the other attempts, but still uh, pretty limited. And the encouraging thing about the UNICEF, a lot of this uh, Johnson & Johnson um, is going to be made in South Africa, as indeed some Oxford AstraZeneca is being made in South Africa at the moment. Not enough, um, but it is starting to uh, increase. So, so far, the vaccination situation, 66 million doses delivered to Africa, 40 million through bilateral deals, 25 million through COVAX. I mean, this is just pathetic. Uh, not many at all. 800,000 doses. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's less, way less than a million, isn't it? Via African Union Vaccine Acquisition Task Team. So not brilliant. 50 million doses administered to date. 1.6% of global cases. The uh, World Health Organization is saying 16 million fully vaccinated, 2% of the population. But the Africa Center for Disease Control, Africa CDC, doesn't put it that highly. It has it a little lower. Uh, that's their website there. They say 1% fully vaccinated, 2.5% at least one dose. And just remind ourselves of that graph with huge unvaccinated uh, areas. So a bit of a black hole, really, in many ways. We need massive input and more endogenous production of vaccines in Africa, that is for sure. Africa vaccine production, so far they've produced about 1% of their own vaccines, and that's in Tunisia, Algeria, South Africa and Senegal. South Africa is the one which can be significantly ramped up uh, as a more technological country. Let's hope that happens fairly soon. Young demographic, of course, still on Africa's side, but just reading anecdotal reports at this stage from, from nurses and doctors in Africa, they're saying that this does seem to be affecting younger patients and they do seem to be getting sicker quicker with the Delta variant. And of course, most of the population are completely naive to the uh, infection. Problems in Africa, poverty, um, corruption, of course, is a huge problem. Corruption at many, many levels in many, many, many parts of Africa. Um, there's even been some alleged corruption in the vaccine roll rollout programme as it's gone so far. And of course, as always, who suffers? We know, of course, it's the poor people that suffer. And this is just quite tragic, of course. Now, I just want to put this in some sort of context because we talk about infectious disease, you know, SARS coronavirus 2, COVID 19 is an infectious disease, but there's many others, of course, in Africa. So I just wanted to quickly look at a couple just to contextualize this. Malaria is preventable and curable. So, um, COVID infection, of course, is a uh, COVID 19 is preventable, um, but debatable whether it's curable and we're certainly not using antivirals although antivirals would be a good idea um so um world cases of malaria 229 million deaths 409,000 cases deaths a year from malaria um, parasitic mosquito born of course children under the age of five are the most vulnerable group children accounting for 67 percent that's 274,000 of all malaria deaths worldwide now this is from the who it's 2019 um, so Africa children's deaths were 257,000 because Africa is 94% of, mala of malaria deaths. So this data is actually 2019, but it's probably worse this year, actually, because of the, the problem of the, of the pandemic. Uh, we won't know for, for some time because there's always a big delay in these things. But um, the pandemic's probably made malaria deaths worse. I can't really see how it would make it better. So under the age of five, 257,560 children died in Africa. It's about 750 or something a day, isn't it? Kind of puts the other issues into some sort of context. And these are childhood deaths. So 490,000 deaths from malaria, 94% of those in, in Africa. Tuberculosis is another massive, massive problem. Um, leprosy used to be one of the big world's contagious diseases, but that's largely been treated now, although there still is some outbreak and TB's kind of taken over from that, really. 
Uh, tuberculosis in Africa, 2.5 million cases in a year. 417,000 deaths in a year. 1.7 million deaths globally from tuberculosis. And of course, tuberculosis, you've guessed it, is preventable and curable. Di simple diarrhea. Thing is with diarrhea, children especially get dehydrated and they die of shock. They become shocked. They get circulatory collapse because of dehydration and electrolyte imbalance with simple diarrhea. Diarrheal disease in Africa, uh, severe cases, 30 million uh, a year. Deaths, 330,000, mostly in the under fives. 330,000, mostly in the under fives, dying of diarrhea in Africa. And of course, diarrhea is preventable and treatable, often with simple oral rehydration salts. Dengue is also a global world, worldwide curse, another mosquito-borne disease. Global infections, 390 million per year, probably about 40% or so at a guess of those in Africa. So we do see this terrible burden, this morbidity and mortality from infectious diseases in Africa, uh, the vast majority of which is preventable and uh, treatable. Parasitic diseases, of course, are much less than they used to be, largely because uh, ivermectin has been able to eliminate a lot of the parasitic uh, diseases, um, which has been absolutely brilliant, and other treatments as well, of course. But um, that is the nature of infectious disease in Africa. So um, there's going to be enough to keep us going if you want to take an interest and help to treat these things. And um, there's certainly enough to keep me going for the rest of my lifetime, unfortunately, um, because of the large burden of infectious diseases that Africa is already suffering from. OK, um, on, on that note, I'm just trying to think of something more positive to say. Uh, yeah, yeah, let's think of something positive to say. These are preventable and treatable if we have the will uh, to prevent and treat. OK, thank you for watching today's talk, of course.